The following program is sponsored by the friends and partners of Ark World Outreach Ministries and Archangel Production. One word from the Lord can transform your life. Impact with Kevin Greer. God bless you. This is Evangelist Kevin Greer with Art World Outreach Ministries in Chicago, USA. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're always grateful that you take time to tune us in. And we believe God's got something special for you tonight. The Word of God is powerful. There's in the book of Luke, the first chapter, when the angel Gabriel told Mary the virgin that she would have a son. And she didn't know how that could be because she was a virgin. She had never known a man. And Gabriel said, nothing shall be impossible with God. Now, the literal translation of that verse was, no word of God shall be void of power. No word of God is empty with pow of power. Every single word of God is power packed. And so we want to bring you a word tonight that we know will be a blessing to you, but you've got to have faith and latch on to it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it's, it's a recipe. It's a formula. It's a mix. The word has got to be mixed with faith. In the book of Hebrews, I believe it's the sixth chapter. It says the word of God was preached to the ancient Israelites as well as to us, but it did not benefit them. They got the same word, but it did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith in those that heard it. You can read the word of God and unless you have faith, it'll be just like reading a book. It'll be just like reading a novel. But when you mix faith with the word of God and when you believe what he says and what you read, good things happen. I mean, I've seen the power of God this year in such a strong way. I've seen more people saved this year in one year in terms of crusades, people coming to the Lord, salvations, healings, deliverances, demons being cast out that any one, but in any one single year in my entire life. And I got saved at the age of 17 because God is moving in a great way. Now time is winding up and God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So these are the days that no matter what kind of bad news you hear, you know, we hear a lot of bad news about I live in Chicago. We, we hear a lot of bad news about the violence in Chicago just in October 2016. This is November now. There were, I believe, 78 people that got murdered, hundreds of people shot. And not only Chicago, we've got our share of troubles. It's a great city. But if you look across the world, we've got problems all around the world, all around the globe. And it's enough to get you depressed. But listen, let me tell you, there's a report from the Lord. And God is moving in a great way. They don't broadcast it on TV. But we are seeing it every day, and he's got something special for you tonight. So let's go right into the word. I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. I want to talk about a topic, and I'm just going to call it the blessing and the battle. Let me repeat that, the blessing and the battle. In the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, I'm going to start reading a couple of verses, starting at verse 3. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In the sixth chapter of that same verse, the same book, book of Ephesians 6 and 10, I want to start reading. This is a very familiar passage of scripture to those of you who are familiar with the Bible in this particular book. Now, after all of this entire book and after telling us that we're blessed and telling us that we were blessed before the foundation of the world, Paul says in 6 and 10, finally, after all of that, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. Now, reading the book of Ephesians, I had always thought, in my own opinion, that the book of Ephesians was written backwards. And when I say backwards, I mean, it seemed to be have, have been written in reverse. It seemed to me that Ephesians 6 and 10 actually probably should, should have been Ephesians 1 and 3. And Ephesians 1 and 3 probably should have been Ephesians 6 and 10. In other words, it seemed logical, which we can just throw out the window when it comes to God because that's man's logic, but it just seemed logical to me that Paul would have started off telling us, listen, you're in a fight and you're wrestling not against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against spirits and demons and spiritual wickedness in high places, but you're going to win. And after you win, you're going to have the blessing on you. The blessing is going to come. It's, it just seemed like the, the logical or the natural order of things. It's almost like it's almost like running a race. I'm running a race, and it's a, it's a fight. It's a race. It's grueling. It's like a marathon. But when I cross that finish line, there's going to be a cup of water, or there's going to be a banner, or there's going to be a trophy, or there's going to be a award, an award. There's going to be a blessing. After I go through the battle, you know, it's, it's like a war. You fight a war or a sporting event, and, and the spoils are after the fight. But that's not what Paul says here, because the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. So all scripture is spirit breathed. So Paul, so to speak, was the ghost writer for the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Spirit started off by telling us that we're blessed. He didn't end up telling us we're blessed. He started off by telling us that we're blessed. And not only are we blessed, but in verse three, it says, God has blessed us. He blessed us in past tense. Matter of fact, it was so far past tense that if you go to the fourth verse of the first chapter, it says, according as he, God, has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In other words, not only were you blessed before you were born, but you were blessed before the world was born. You were blessed before the world was even formed because God formed the world for you. I mean, it's almost like a couple having a child. Now, you know, with modern technology, you know, ultrasound, they couldn't do it you know, years and years ago, but with ultrasound and whatever technology they have, you can tell the gender of the child. And even if you can't tell the gender of the child, you know when the child is coming. So what a couple will do is prepare for the child. We'll prepare, you know, clothes. If it's, if it's a boy, they, they get boy appropriate clothes. If it's a girl, they'll get girl appropriate clothes. They'll get the bassinet. They'll clear space in the home. They'll do all the things that one does to prepare. So when the baby arrives, everything is set. But this is what God did for mankind. We read in the book of Genesis, the creation story in the first chapter, God made light, made the sun and the moon and the stars and the seas and the animals and the green herbs of the field. And he made all of that. And then he made man. So when man came, everything was set up. And it's the same thing that he's done for you and I. So God chose us before the foundation of the world to be blessed. Adam was blessed. He was the first man that was created. So Adam was blessed, but he sinned. And when he sinned, the curse came upon him. And so the blessing was gone. He lost the blessing by disobedience of God. But Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, won it all back on the cross. If you look at Galatians, the book of Galatians, the third chapter and the 13th verse, it says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. So we were under the curse. But Jesus redeemed us from the curse. There's, there's no in between. Everybody that's ever been born and everybody that's on the earth right now is either blessed because they're in Jesus Christ or they're cursed because they're not. There's, there's no middle ground. So if you're saved, you're blessed. If you're not saved, you're not blessed. But listen, the blessing was set up for you. And before this broadcast is over, we're going to give you an opportunity to come over to the Holy Ghost side, to the hallelujah side, to the winning side. So there's either the blessing or a curse. Now, 
There's a lot of people that are saved and they are not living a blessed life. Now you can you can be you can be blessed and not living a blessed life. Now you say, well, how can that be? Well, let me give you an example. Let's talk about a credit card. You can have a credit card come to your home. It might have any kind of credit limit. It might have a fifteen thousand dollar credit limit. It might have a, a twenty thousand dollar credit limit, or maybe you know you're one of these people that are like super credit worthy, and you've got the black card. So whatever comes to your house, you've got that credit card. Now this credit card represents power. It represents purchasing power. It represents spending power. But it won't work until you read that number that's on that card pick up the phone and call the card issuer and activate the card. So the card is potential, but there's something that you have to do to activate it. And this is how the blessing works. See, when you're saved, you're blessed. The blessing is upon you, but it won't work until you activate the blessing. The following is an important message from Ark World Outreach Ministries. Today, more than ever, we live in a complex, ever-changing world. But the solutions to life's problems is found in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The challenges of everyday life are always present. But through God's love and grace, you can live a victorious life in Christ. The vision and mission of Ark World Outreach Ministries is to advance God's kingdom, one soul at a time. We'd like to take this opportunity to ask you to get involved as we reach the loss for Jesus. To sow a seed of any amount, become a monthly partner, or for prayer, please call us toll-free at 1-866-327-5561 or write us at ARC World Outreach Ministries, P.O. Box 437390, Chicago, Illinois, 60643-7390. Connecting with us is easier than ever. Like us on Facebook www.facebook.com slash arcworldchicago.org or visit us online at www.arcworldchicago.org to request prayer, partner with us, or find resources designed to help you live a victorious life in Christ. Arc World Outreach Ministries is a 501c3 nonprofit organization under the U.S. Internal Revenue Code. Donations to the ministry are tax deductible in the U.S. only in accordance with the United States tax laws. Impact with Kevin Greer is the broadcast outreach of ARC World Outreach Ministries. You've got to get the blessing working for you. So how do you do that? You activate the blessing by faith in God and by doing what he says. See, there's, there's principles that God has set up that he even won't break. The Bible says God holds his, his word above his name. I, used to, I read that once and I said, well, Lord, that doesn't make much sense. How can anything be above your name? And the Lord said to me, son, I hold my word above my name because my word makes my name. My name doesn't make my word. And I thought about that and it made perfect sense because each of us are only good as our word. In other words, the day you break your word, nobody's going to trust you anymore. You don't have any credibility anymore. I mean, you're kind of sunk. So your reputation doesn't make what you say. What you say makes your reputation when you keep what you say. The day that God ceases to keep a promise, he would cease to be God, and that's impossible because God cannot lie. So all you got to do is trust the word and do what he says. When he says, so then you sow. When he says do good, you do good. And he says always do good. So when you obey God, there's divine principles that will kick in. And so there's a law of faith and there's a law of the blessing. See, the blessing on your life is independent, but it's dependent on you. Let me say that again. The blessing in your life is independent. In other words, it'll work on its own, but it's dependent on you. Let me give you an example. You can have the meanest junkyard attack dog that's ever been trained. You know, Rottweiler, Pitbull, 
uh, uh, Doberman, Pinscher, you know, Kita. You know, a lot of people think Kitas are cute. You know, uh, uh, you know they're furry and they're big, but you know they're listed as listed as some of the the most dangerous dogs in the world. Standard poodles. I'm not talking about those little toy poodles, and, you know, a Shih Tzu or something like that. I'm talking about a standard poodle. They're listed as some pretty vicious dogs. But be that the case, you can have the meanest attack dog in the world, but if you have a muzzle on that dog, and if you got a chain collar on the dog, the dog is independent. But he's dependent on you because you can't do anything until you turn him loose. But if you turn that dog loose, if you take the muzzle off and if you take that chain collar off of that dog and turn him loose, listen, the dog's not going to turn around and say, listen, help me chase this guy down. And when we catch him, help me bite him. The dog doesn't need you after that. Once you unleash that dog, he's going to do excuse my, my, the King's English, he's going to do what dogs do. He's going to do as the dog is supposed to do. He's going to be an attack dog. But the blessing is the same way. See, once you unleash the blessing by faith, the blessing will work. Now, the key to be motivated to unleash the blessing is you've got to know its power. The patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'll throw Joseph in there because he was like a little patriarch, in the book of Genesis, but the patriarchs knew the blessing. They knew the power of the blessing. See, if you read the book of Genesis, you won't see very many miracles in the book of Genesis. Now, you know, Isaac being born was, was a miracle. Abraham was about 100 years old, and, and, and Sarah was probably 90 or however old she was. People lived a little longer back then than they do now, a lot longer, as a matter of fact. But Abraham had had Ishmael even before Isaac. And after, after Sarah died, he, had, he married Keturah and had a bunch of other children. So Abraham, I mean, he was old, but he didn't, he, didn't have a, he didn't have a lot of problems there. But it was a miracle. But outside of that, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you don't see miracles in earnest in the Bible until the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, when they were in slavery and they needed to be freed. See, a miracle, and don't knock me, I don't, you know, don't, don't mistake me, I don't knock miracles, don't, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. You know, like I said, I've, I've seen miracles over my life and even this year that, you know, just, it's just the power of God, there's no other way to explain it. But a miracle is almost a rescue. And God can work a miracle in your life. But when you're blessed, when you're blessed with good health, when you're blessed with prosperity, when you're, when you're, when you're blessed you know, uh, with joy and peace, you don't really need a miracle because you're living a blessed life. That's how it was in the book of Genesis because they knew the power of the blessing and they knew that when, you, when they blessed that the blessing would work on its own. Let me give you an example. Come with me to the book of Genesis, the 27th chapter. And this is the familiar story, again, to those, for those of you that read your Bible, this is the familiar story of Isaac, of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Now, Isaac was the son of Abraham. Jacob and Esau were his twin sons. Esau was older than Jacob. They were twins, but Esau uh, came out first. So Esau was the older, and he was the older brother, so he had the birthright, and the blessing by birthright belonged to him. Now, when it came time to dole out the blessing, Isaac was blind. He had gotten old and he, and he couldn't see. And so Esau was a hunter and he smelled like the field. He was a hairy man. And Jacob, he was kind of like a tent dweller and he wasn't a guy that was hanging out in the field and he wasn't a hairy man. And they kind of played favorites in the family. So Esau was the favorite of Isaac and Jacob was the favorite of his mother, Rebecca. So Rebecca and Jacob, well, actually, Rebecca came up with the scheme to have her son Jacob blessed and steal Esau's blessing. So make a long story short, Esau went out on the field to, to catch a deer and then make his father some food. Rebecca dressed up her son Jacob, sent him in to pretend to be Esau. And again, the, the father was blind and he blessed Jacob instead of blessing Esau. So let's take the story up in Genesis 27 and 30. And it says, and it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of his father 
that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also had made savory meat, good food, and brought it to his father and said unto his father, let my father arise and eat of my son's venison, that your soul may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. 33rd verse says, Isaac trembled very exceedingly. He quaked. He was, his knees were knocking. And he said, who? Where is he that has taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten all of it before you came and have blessed him. Yea, and he shall be blessed. So the point I'm making here is the knowledge of the power of the blessing that the patriarchs had and that we should have as children of God. You've got to know the blessing will work. Verse 33 says, Isaac trembled exceedingly. He was terrified. Now, you've got to understand where he was. Abraham had left Ur of the Chaldees, basically Mesopotamia and Babylonia. And God sent him into Canaan. The people in Canaan were wicked. There were Amorites and Hittites and Jebusites and Hivites and all kinds of sinners before the Lord. And it was just him basically and his family and his servants. So Isaac was a son. They were living among enemies. Isaac had no idea who he had just blessed. He could have blessed his enemy, the man that was going to kill him. But he knew whoever he blessed was going to be blessed. So that's the knowledge of the power. He was terrified. And he was terrified not because he blessed Jacob, his own son. He didn't know who he had blessed. He just knew that once he let that dog go, it was going to work. So this is the, this is the power of the blessing. So getting back to our text, now that you know you're blessed, now you know the power of the blessing, now that you know what the blessing will do, and now you, that you know its availability for you, Let's end up the way Paul ends up. Now, Paul says, you're already blessed. But in Ephesians 6.10, he says, finally, my brother, put, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, and you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So Paul said, you're blessed, but you're in a battle. Why are you in a battle after you're blessed? Well, let me give you a couple of analogies. In, in, in most wars, once victory is declared and one side surrenders, the word doesn't get around to all the fighting soldiers, especially on the losing side. Or maybe on the losing side, they've done a lot of things that need to be undone. So even though victory has been won, even though victory has been declared, even though there's been triumph, there's still a lot of skirmishes going on. So that's what's called in military terms a mop-up operation. So you're kind of cleaning up the mess of war. Now, the devil is a defeated foe, but he's still a foe. He's still fighting. Now, Jesus made a show of the devil openly. I mean, he put Satan on front street because the devil had him, or he thought he had him. I mean, you know, after Jesus was crucified and Jesus was in the ground for three days, I mean, the devil probably figured, you know, and all the demons, like, you know, it's over. We won. You know, I mean, they probably had the biggest party that you could imagine demons ever having. But after three days, Jesus got up. And when he got up, he had the keys of death and hell with him. And he made a show. In other words, he, he really made, he embarrassed the devil and, and the demons. Made a show of them openly. So they lost. Now, if he hadn't rose, if Jesus hadn't rose, then the devil would have won. But we know that Jesus rose from the dead. So, but he's still fighting because he's trying to take down as many people, being the, the enemy, the devil, as he can. See, the devil doesn't want you to be blessed. It, it's been like that from the very beginning. When God made Adam and Eve in the, first book, book of, in, the, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, the Bible says that God created Adam and Eve and he blessed them. And he said, have dominion and be fruitful. So the blessing was summed up in two words, to have and to be. 
It doesn't take a lot of effort to have something. It takes a lot of effort to take something. It takes a lot of effort to try to be something. But to just be what God made you and to have what he's given you is easy. And that's the blessing summed up in two words, to have and to be. So Adam was walking under the blessing. I mean, he had everything he had, he needed. He was in a garden. He had dominion. God was giving him authority. He brought all the animals to him. He named all the animals. He, he created his wife from his rib. He named her. He had a companion. He, all he had to do was, uh, was till the garden and expand it around the world. And here comes the enemy and tricked him. And the enemy tricked him because he couldn't stand him, Adam, being blessed. This is why Jesus said in John 10 and 10, 10, 10 and 10, the thief comes not before to steal, to kill and to destroy. So Jesus called him a thief very appropriately because no one can take anything from you that doesn't belong to you. See, nothing is stolen from you if you don't have legal rights to it, if you don't have possession of it, if you, do, if you don't have rights that are paid. And Jesus paid it all. He paid for your health. He paid for you, uh, for you not to be in poverty. He paid for, for your deliverance. He paid for your freedom from bondage. He paid for your freedom from addiction. He paid for your freedom from alcoholism, from drug addiction, from depression, from fear. He paid it all, and it's yours. That's the blessing summed up. But the enemy wants to take it from you. That's the fight. Now, in John 16, 33, Jesus gave us two guarantees. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. Job said, man that's born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. But the second part of John 16, 33, Jesus gave you another guarantee. It's a greater guarantee. He said, be of good cheer. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have some problems. But he said, cheer up. Be encouraged. Be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And I'm in you. And then greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, the enemy. So nothing can stop you. See, when the blessing's on you, you'll have people scratching your head. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, listen, the wind blows where it wants to and it comes when it wants and it goes where and you don't know whether it's coming or going. He said, so is everyone that's born of the spirit. When the blessing is on you and you're born of the spirit, you'll have them coming and going. They'll be wondering, why is this guy always winning? Why does this lady always come out on top? Why does, why does it seem like, you know, she's spiritual Teflon? Things happen, but they don't stick because you're walking under the blessing. And so today, this is all God is saying, is that he's paid it all. Jesus paid the price. You don't have to pay the price. He's paid the price for everything that you need and everything that you're going to need. Thank you for watching Impact with Kevin Greer, the broadcast outreach of Ark World Outreach Ministries. And remember, one word from the Lord can transform your life.